topic is going to be my personal favorite quant topic. We are going to talk about geometry. Um, and to talk about geometry, we are going to use some problems from this book, uh, which if you are going to get two books to prepare for the GRE, I would say get the official guide. That's number one. It's made by the people who make the test. It is your number one resource. And then this would be a great second book to get because it is literally five pounds. It is an enormous compendium of GRE problems. Um, so it's all the practice you really should ever need. So we'll see some problems from this book tonight. And this is what we're going to cover. We are going to talk about a process for tackling the, the quant questions that have to do with geometry. Um, to do that, we're going to have to talk about some facts for geometry. So if you are someone who maybe hasn't done math in a while, don't worry. We are going to review all of the sort of math facts that you need to solve these problems tonight. And then we're going to look at two different types of shapes in a couple of different problem formats. And because it seems like there's a lot of folks who are new to the GRE tonight, I'll take some time to talk about those formats too. So hopefully I can give you everything you need to solve these problems tonight. Um, and if we have some time at the end, then maybe we'll do a little bit of a more open-ended question and answer session. Uh, so uh, please uh, engage in the chat. Uh, a lot. I want this to be as interactive as it can be, um, and hopefully we'll learn some cool stuff about preparing for the GRE. All right, so to start, uh, I actually want to start by playing a game, um, and the game is called Name That Shape. So I'm going to give you a description, and I want you to chat in as soon as you know it, what shape does this statement describe? All points are equidistant from the center. What kind of shape do we have here? Yeah, yay, awesome. We got it. This is a circle. Cool, we have the center of the circle, and then we have a radius that goes to the edge, and that radius is the same all the way around. Nice. Four sides, all the same length. Ah, this is a tricky one. It could be a square, but it doesn't have to be a square. It, for me to be certain that this statement described, oh, Sunny, yeah, Vanita, Alex, yeah, you guys got it. This is a trick one. This is a rhombus. So if I only know, if this is all I know, that there are four sides that are all the same length, then what I have is a rhombus. Uh, four sides where two sets are parallel. It could be a rectangle, yeah, but the broader category here is parallelogram. Similar to number three, I would have to know a couple other things, or at least one other thing to be certain that I had a rectangle. Oh, trapezoid only has one set of parallel sides. That's a trapezoid. What about this? Four sides that meet at right angles. Now we have our rectangle. Yep. Yeah. Quadrilateral could be any. So all of these ones, two, three, and four, we're talking about are quadrilaterals, any four-sided shape. But if I have all right angles, then I know that's when I know that I have a rectangle. That right angle is super important for defining a rectangle. And now it's this one. Four sides, all the same lengths. Yeah, this is our square. So to be certain that something is a square, I actually have to know a lot about it. I need to know the lengths of the sides and I need to know the angles. And then I know that I'm dealing with a square. Three sides, all the same length. What's that? It is a triangle. What kind of triangle? Yeah, there we go. Equilateral triangle. Yep. And one more. Also a triangle, but now what is it called? Two sides the same length. Yeah, isosceles. Oh my god. I, I got so many different spellings of isosceles, I forgot how to spell it too. I'll be honest, my spelling is not my strength. Um, Good news, you can do well in the GRE and not be amazing at spelling. Uh, cool. So why are we starting by playing this game? Well, we are starting to think about one of the big tricks that the GRE likes to play when they deal with geometry questions. And that trick is this. 
they're going to often give you diagrams to illustrate the shapes that are described. But these diagrams can be very misleading. So when we get a geometry question, we want to be very skeptical of the diagram that we're given because these diagrams are not drawn to scale. So for example, thinking about our definitions, when we saw like, oh, four sides, all the same length, oh, it's a square, we want to be very careful of making that assumption because we want to say, no, if I want to be certain that it's a square, I want to know that there are right angles. I want to be able to prove that. So one of the very first things that we think about when we get a geometry question is being very skeptical of that diagram that we're given. If they haven't specifically described or labeled something, we don't want to assume that it is what it looks like. We can trust, obviously, if it's a straight line, it's a straight line. Here, if a point seems to come between two other points, that's true. If they give me a description, that description matches the drawing that's also given. So they will not give us stuff that is straight up wrong, because that would be impossible. That would be mean. But they may give us stuff that's trying to mislead or trick us in some way. So for example, if I took away this description here, and I just gave you this shape. What could you tell me? Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. What could you tell me about what this shape is? This bottom one here, if I didn't give you a description. Adina, would you know for sure it's a rectangle? Would you be certain those are right angles? Are you certain that those lines are parallel? It could be a rhombus, but we're not totally sure. Yeah, we know there's straight lines, and we know that there are four sides. And so for all those folks who are saying quadrilateral, you got it. I would know that this shape has four sides, but just because it looks like they're right angles and parallel sides, I wouldn't be able to trust that. The GRE would have to give me more information, like, for example, giving me a description that tells me this is a rectangle or adding a notation that shows me these are right angles or parallel sides. So we want to be very skeptical. Now, I, one of the things I really, one of the reasons I think I like teaching geometry is uh, it's a little different from the other stuff on in the test in quant, and we have a slightly different process for it. And this process is very visual and very logical, and I like visual solutions and I like logic. So. I love geometry. Um, when it comes to geometry, this is the process that we want to follow. So you see a question, it gives you a drawing, it describes a shape. First thing you want to do is draw or redraw that shape. Um, so get it on your paper. You get scratch paper when you take the GRE, a couple of sheets of blank paper folded together. So draw it, draw it nice and big so that you then can label stuff on it and add information to it. So first step is just take the information from the problem, consolidate it on your paper. And that's great. Now you know how to start every geometry problem you're ever going to see on the GRE. Second thing you're going to do, you're going to figure out what is it that you are solving for. You're going to focus on what the question is asking for. And for me, I often like to highlight that on the shape or make a note of it. Because a lot of these problems are set up so that it can be really easy to do all the hard math correctly and then accidentally solve for the wrong thing or input the wrong answer. That's a very, very common trap. So I want to make a note and be very clear on what I'm looking for. And then all I have to do from there, once I get that nice setup, is start applying the rules that I know about geometry to fill in the information that's missing. And this is a very step-by-step -step logical process. So let's say I got something like this. I'd say, okay, I know there's 180 degrees in a triangle. So I can fill in this missing angle. It's 45. And then I'd say, all right, it's an isosceles right triangle. So I can fill in this missing side here. Isosceles, two sides the same. That side has to be three. And all right, I know. The Pythagorean theorem for right triangles, or I know that this is a special right triangle, and we're going to talk about both of those tonight. So if those rules feel fuzzy, don't worry, we're going to chat about them. And I'd say, all right, so I can find that missing side. So it's a very step-by-step, piece-by-piece process. That's why they're fun. The downside, however, is that there are a lot of geometry rules to learn. So we're going to get into doing some GRE problems, but before we do that, 
I want to just walk us through a few of the rules that we're going to use to solve these problems tonight. It's a nice chance to start refreshing on some math. Check in uh, with what you remember, what you don't. Um, if there's any rules that we discuss that you don't remember, maybe take a note of those in your notebook so that later you can put them on a flashcard and learn them. Flashcards are an excellent way to start practicing with quant. All right, so let's start with triangles. Uh, let's do this together, one at a time. Here I have a triangle, I have two angles. What is the measure of that third angle, number one? Yeah, nice, yep. 60. Awesome. Because I know that all of the angles in a triangle have to sum to 180. So I can subtract 120 from 180 and I get 60. Okay. Here I have a triangle. I need to add a little piece of information here, I realize. What is the area of this triangle here? Nice. Yeah, you guys got it. Area is one half base times height. So 10 times 3, half of that, and I get 15. How do I define height in a triangle? Can anyone give us a like, quick summation? How do I know something is the height of a triangle? How do we know that 3 was the height here? Yeah, yep, awesome, yep. I start at the base and I go to the vertex opposite, awesome, and then I draw a line straight down, it's perpendicular, and that's my height. So my height is at a right angle to my base. Sometimes it might actually be a side of a triangle, if I have a right triangle, but sometimes it's an extra line that I draw in. Just like measuring height in a building, right? Like you go to the highest point and go straight down to the ground, same as with measuring height in a triangle. All right, so here, these little lines are used to denote two equal sides. So we've already talked about this one. This is an isosceles triangle. Yeah. Um, now I'm spelling it correctly. Uh, <laughs> what is angle five going to be here? Yeah, yep. In triangles, Side length is proportional or related to the opposite angle. So I know that these two angles, five and this one I just drew in, they have to be the same. So I can say, okay, 180 minus 40 divided by two. It gives me my missing angle. Here, I have all three sides the same. We talked about this one. It's an equilateral triangle. And what are the angle measures in equilateral triangle? Nice. Always 60 degrees. Awesome. Yay. Okay. And finally, I have a triangle. I have a side of five. I have a side of eight. What is the range of values that that third side can fall between? I have two answers. Let's see if we get any other votes. Oh, nice. Irvashi has written out sort of the underlying logic here. Yeah. Um, so if you see Irvashi's answer, it has to be between, it has to be greater than the difference. So it has to be greater than 8 minus 5, which is 3. And it has to be, so it has to be greater than that. And it has to be less than the sum, which is 13. So if I knew two sides of a triangle, I can find a range of values for the third. All right. A couple more things to say about triangles. Right triangles. Uh, so a special type of triangle. Um, here, let's start with number one. If I know the two legs, the two short sides of a right triangle, how do I find the hypotenuse? Yeah, I use the Pythagorean theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So I take the squares of the two legs, and that gives me the square of the hypotenuse. Uh, Tejas, uh, we can use the 30, 60, 90 rule, 
when we get over here. But for this one, we have to use Pythagoras. Yeah. I'm going to come back to you when we get to the 30, 60, 90, because that's a good one. Yeah. So in this case, I do 2 squared plus 3 squared equals c squared, and I would get 13 equals c squared. So here I get square root of 13. What about this, number 2? Here I have a leg, a short side that's 3, and my hypotenuse, my longest side, is 5. What is that missing side going to be? Nice. Ah, people are so fast, and people are fast because they didn't need to use the Pythagorean theorem here. So here we're seeing weird square root, which happens a lot with right triangles. But there are a few patterns of sort of common integer sides, the Pythagorean triples, where we don't need to use the Pythagorean theorem if we have them memorized. Three, four, five is one. Does, can anyone name some of the others? These sort of common patterns that show up in right triangles. Yeah, 7, 24, 25. 5, 12, 13. Yeah, 3, 4, 5, also 6, 8, 10. Any multiples of each of these works as well. Um, the other one that sometimes shows up is 8, 15, 17. Cool. Okay. So now let's get into these two right triangles. These are my two special right triangles. So here, if this angle is 45 degrees, what is the missing angle also going to be? Yeah. And so number three, what is the length of this leg? Awesome. This is my isosceles right triangle. So when I have this 45, 45, 90 triangle or an isosceles right triangle, what is my hypotenuse going to be? It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be close. It's going to be a little bit more than six. Uh, yeah, it's going to be 5 square root 2. So when we think about 45, 45, 90, it's sort of saying, like, okay, the two sides are the same, and then the hypotenuse is the side, the leg length, times the square root of 2. These are great because this is a one case where I can have one side of a right triangle and some angles, and I can find the other sides. Normally with the Pythagorean theorem, I have to know two sides to find the third. But here, I only have to know one side and an angle. The GRE loves these. You see them a lot. This is also how I would find the hypotenuse, I mean the diagonal, sorry, the diagonal of a square. Cuts a square in half. All right. So this is one of my special right triangles, one of my triangles where I get some angles and I can find the sides. Uh, this is my 30, 60, 90 triangle. Uh, Tejas, what can you tell us, uh, or Tejas, I'm pretty sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, I'm just thinking of uh, Spanish. Um, what can you, you mentioned 30, 60, 90 triangles earlier. What can you tell us about the missing sides here? Or anyone else who wants to jump in? You just, we're very excited about 30, 60, 90. What will this be, the other leg? Yeah, yep, nice. Hypotenuse is gonna be twice the short side, half of that, cool. And then middle side, yeah. Middle side is the short side times the square root of three. If these, maybe you're like, oh, I've seen it before, but it's been a while, or these weren't coming super quick to your the surface of your head, great things to flashcard. The GRE likes them. They show up a lot. They are very important to know. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So uh, let's solve a problem that uses triangles. Reminder, draw, label, go step by step. Be clear on what you're looking for. Three tips. What I'm going to ask for this next problem, if you get an answer, chat me what your answer is, but chat it just to me. So in the chat, you can change the to field from everyone to uh, panelists, um, and then if you change it that way, you'll chat it just to me. So solve this. As soon as you get an answer, tell me what you got, but just share that answer with me. 
here is the problem. I'll give you a little bit of time to work on it. All right, let's chat about this one. Okay, so uh, here I know this angle is 45. So I know this is also X. And I remember with geometry, I wanna go step by step. So I have a number here that's 10. Eventually I wanna get there, but I'm probably gonna have to do some intermediate steps. So I say, okay, if I have a 45, 45, 90 triangle, I can find the hypotenuse of that triangle. What's the length of that line that I just outlined in blue in terms of X? In terms of X, yeah, we'll get to, we'll get to numbers. Um, but yeah, if I'm starting with X, I'd say, okay, this hypotenuse here is X squared root two. And then I have another 45, 45, 90, so I'd know this side is also x square root two. So now, what do I need to do to get from x square root two to 10? Okay, I can think about setting up an equation, x square root two times what equals 10? Yeah, just another root two, because it's another side of a 45, 45, 90. Square root of two times square root of two just gives me two. Multiplying two square roots together like that undoes the square root. So I get two x equals 10, x equals five, and c is my answer. Now, I saw a bunch of people choosing d. d was really popular. What mistake or, or why might we end up with d? Like, what is, where is there an opportunity to make some kind of error in this problem? And I want to talk about errors because that's actually where we learn the most interesting stuff. So I'm really curious about how people got to D or how someone might get to D. Mm, yeah. So sort of like mis, misattributing X. Yep. Solve for the wrong thing. Yeah, so that's why part of my process, even if it seemed redundant when I said it, step two, 
identify what you're looking for. And so if I were solving this problem, I would draw this out and I would circle X like this, or I would write X and I would put a big box around it so that I'm really clear, okay, that's what I'm looking for. And I'm gonna be really precise about that. Yeah, of course, also sometimes it's just little mechanical facts and you're like, okay, cool. I need to go review square roots a little bit more and then I'm good and I'll clean that up. This, what we just did, is actually the most important thing to do when you review or when you study. So it's great to do a lot of problems, but even more important is you wanna learn something from each problem that goes beyond just that problem. So is there a larger lesson about process or things to review or types of errors that you make that you can take away from having done this problem that you can apply to other problems? Because you're not gonna see this particular problem on the official test. So actually, if you are gonna remember one thing from tonight's workshop, I actually, this is what I want you to remember. Every time you do a problem, you should pause and take some time to analyze possible pitfalls, to pinpoint where you made a mistake if you made one, and to think about what's a bigger lesson or takeaway that I could take away from this problem. Um, and that's one of the, the practices that I see students who see really strong score improvement doing more than anything else. So beyond geometry facts and geometry process, that's actually the thing that I think I can tell you tonight that may be most useful, especially if you're just starting out with study. All right, questions about this problem? Because if not, I think we should do another triangle problem. All right, let's do another triangle problem. So I'm just gonna say, if you wanna start solving, if you, you sort of know GRE stuff and you wanna start solving this problem, awesome, go for it. But this is a different format from the multiple choice we just saw. So for folks who are new, I just am gonna say a quick word about this format. So this is a format called quantitative comparison. You know, abbreviated quant comp. I also often will call it QC. And here our task is to compare the two quantities say which of these is bigger. And there's gonna be four answers. Answer choice A is gonna be A is always bigger. B is gonna be B is always bigger. So far, so good. C is gonna be that they're equal. And D is gonna be that you can't tell. So that is our task in this problem. Go ahead, if you haven't already, start solving. Same thing, if you get an answer, go ahead and chat it. Um, to me. All right, let's talk about this one. Cool, some, some good stuff. If I just took, if I took away the answer choices here, and this problem just asked you to solve for X, get a precise value for that angle, could you do it? Yeah, we can't actually do it. 
Yeah, we don't actually, for GRE purposes at least, there is not enough information given to calculate the value of X. Yeah, and it's definitely not drawn to scale. So it looks like it's 90 degrees here, but we wouldn't want to assume that because it's not drawn to scale. So here, I think answer choice D is tempting because I'd say like, oh, I can't, I can't solve precisely. However, answer choice D is not right. And a lot of people chose a different answer. So why is it that I can't solve for X, but I can answer this question? What's the other piece of information that's helpful here? Yeah, yep. I have a number, as Anna points out, in quantity B. So I don't need to know what X is, I just need to know how it relates to 90. And then Sunny pointed out and Justin pointed out that I could say, okay, what would have to be true if X equaled 90? Well, if X equaled 90, we know we have one of our Pythagorean triples, one of our right triangles that's 5, 12, 13. So if X equaled 90, I would expect this side here to be 13, so I can rule out C. And then I see, okay, 13.5 is bigger than 13. So because side length and angle size relate, this has to be, this angle is going to have to be bigger than 90. So I can choose answer choice A. So this here is a really useful lesson that you can apply not just to geometry, but to all of QC. Compare, don't calculate. Always focus on comparing rather than on having to solve for things precisely. And if there's a number, it will be in quantity B. And it's often a useful benchmark. So if stuck, think about that number. Ask what would be true if quantity A equaled quantity B. And even if you have a quantity A that you can't calculate, like here, often you can use that number in quantity B to still be able to answer. Plus, sometimes it'll just make it faster. So sometimes you have to use this approach to solve a QC problem. Sometimes it's just a cool shortcut. And you may sometimes see this strategy called cheat off B or B as benchmark. Doesn't matter what you want to call it, but the important thing, when you get a QC problem, look at what the quantities are. If you see a number in quantity B, use that number. In general, in quant, this is also a super, super important thing. Look at the answer choices in quant problems. They are really helpful. They are an extra piece of information about the problem. So anytime I get a quant problem, you know, I read the problem, but I also glance at the answer choices, whether it's QC or multiple choice, and that'll really help. Anyone have questions about this? Should always feel free to throw in questions. All right, cool. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's look at circles. Um, I want to review a few quick circle facts, and then I want to get into some cool circle problems. All right, here I have a circle. The diameter is six. What's the radius? Nice. It's three. I know that two radius equals diameter. What's the area of this circle? Yeah. Mm, be careful. It's uh it's pi r squared. So it's gonna be nine pi. Don't want to square the diameter. Cool. And what's the circumference? Yeah, circumference is pi d or two pi r. It's gonna be six pi. And for GRE purposes, a lot of times the answer choices are given in terms of pi. So you don't always have to convert pi into a decimal, get an actual number. A lot of times you'll just work with pi throughout a problem. Um, occasionally you might need to approximate pi. What's an approximation of pi as a number? Yeah, 3.14. Cool. Um, or 22 over 7. Yeah, if you want to work with fractions, that's a good one too. Okay, so now instead of a whole circle, I'm just dealing with a sector. 
So I have a circle with a radius of 12, and I just have this sector here, A, B, C, D. And this central angle is 120 degrees. How would I find the area of just this slice? How do you know, Pranav, that it's a third of the total? You're right. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. This angle is a portion of 360 degrees. So in this case, it's 120 degrees out of 360, which is 1 over 3. So that tells me that this sector, because it's taking up a third of the angles, it's taking up a third of the circle as a whole, so a third of the area. So I just do 1 third times 12 squared pi. So 1 third of the area of this circle. If we're going to use the same logic, but now deal with the length of the arc, so just with the outer edge here, how would I find the length of that arc? Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's going to be one third of the circumference. It's one third of that total edge of the circle. Yeah, Persia, where did I lose you? I, I agree. I don't think this is, I think, the trickiest, maybe the trickiest geometry fact we're doing tonight. So totally understandable. The question that we're sort of asking is like, what portion? So the answer to four is going to be one third of the total area of the circle. So it would be 144, 12 squared over three times pi. I didn't do out all the calculation, but yeah, it's saying like, I'm going to take the total area of the circle and then I know that this chunk is one third. How, how simplified you have to get would depend on the answers to the problem. Um, but yeah, you then would continue to solve. 48. Or not 48 pi. Is it 48? Oh, it is 48. Um, yeah, you would probably go ahead and do it out. I was just trying to move fast and not simplifying all the way. No, it was just me being excited about getting to a problem. But yeah, that's another reason, though, to look at the answers because it'll tell you, like, do I need to keep in terms of pi? Do I need to change to a decimal? Like, it'll also tell you a little bit about how far you have to go with the mechanics. Okay, so feeling good with circle facts. Let's do a circle problem. This is also a QC problem. So same A, B, C, D answers. Here we go.
All right. Let's chat a bit about this one. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of little pieces to this problem. It's often true, not just of geometry, but word problems, other things we see on the GRE. So if I see something and my first thought is like, wow, this looks complicated, there's a lot, I try to focus just on one thing to start and then build from there. Because trying to often comprehend a problem as a whole, especially as problems get harder and harder, gets really tricky. So I'm just going to start. And in any QC problem, I try to start just with this. I just start with this upfront information. And I'd say, okay, I have a diagram O, and I have a large diameter, and I have a small diameter. Maybe I'll draw those in so I have a good visual. And I know that the diameter of the large one or the diameter of the small one is 60% of the diameter of the large one. So I already see up front that one way to do this problem is with these two variables. I could do this problem with algebra. However, I think the algebra might get kind of messy, like two variables, it's complicated. So I'm going to also ask myself, do I have to use variables here? That's my question for you. Is Do I have to use variables or is there a way I could work through this problem without having these two variables? You're right, it's no. What's the way to avoid the variables? Yeah, Hannah, yep, Urashi, how do we know that we're allowed to pick numbers here? Because you're totally right. I can just pick arbitrary numbers. Yeah, if I see a problem that is all percents or all fractions or all ratios, so there's no actual number in this problem. There's just things that describe comparisons or relationships. Then I can just assign a number. So I'm going to assign a number to the diameter of the large circle. What would be a good number to pick? Yeah, Rashi. Yeah, lots of people. I like 10. 100 works too because 10 and 100, it's easy to take percents of. But I like 10 because it's small. So when we're picking numbers, thinking about just picking something that's going to be easy for you. So diameter of the large is 10. If the diameter of the large is 10, what's the diameter of the small one? Cool. Yeah. And then I might also put down the radii. It's going to be 5. And that's going to be 3. All right. So I've really thought through that upfront information. I've thought about a strategy or an approach. Now I'm going to get into the quantities, but again, piece by piece, not trying to do everything at once. Let's look at quantity A, the area of the shaded region. So here I'm just looking for this ring. I don't have a formula for like a ring. I just have formulas for circles. So how can I find the area of that ring? What do I need to do to find the area of like just the shaded part? Yeah, yep. So when I see blended or sort of complicated figures like this, I still fall back on the same formulas. I just have to use a couple tricks. And here the trick is to do the whole minus the sort of missing piece. And that's a common technique for dealing with complicated figures. Like, okay, if I just want the ring, I'll find the whole big circle and I'll take out the piece that I don't want, like taking the hole out of a donut. So here for quantity A, I could just do the area of the large, which is gonna be the radius squared times pi minus the area of the small, which again is radius squared times pi. So I get 25 pi minus nine pi equals 16 pi. Awesome. Now I deal with quantity B. So again, one piece at a time. All right. So now I have a circle whose diameter is 80% of this. What's the diameter of the circle here? I'm starting with 10. Yeah, 
Now my diameter is eight. So my radius is four. And so here, 16 pi. So these are actually equal. And the answer to this one is C. So you saw a bunch of people getting two. I also saw some people with different answers. B was a popular answer as well. Um, I'm curious, uh, share a takeaway. Is there something that you learned from this problem that you think might be helpful for solving other geometry problems? If you got this right, maybe something you did that you think would help as these problems get harder. If you made a small error, maybe something you learned from that error. Um, or if you're still kind of stuck on something, ask a question. But everyone chat in. What's something cool to learn from this problem? Even if it felt easy to, I bet there's something you did here that was good that you want to reinforce as things get harder. Yeah, pick numbers if you can. Strategy choice often equals speed. Ah, yeah. Watch details. Persia, we just picked, uh, we just picked that number. Because we said it doesn't, you know, I could put in any number to this problem and get the same result. It doesn't matter how big that diameter is. All that matters is how these different diameters relate. So I just said, let's make it 10, because that's going to be an easy number to do these calculations with. I could have also made that X. Um, Ezekiel, it is not bad. <laughs> at all. Um, I know there are a lot of people here who are actually more people than, than, than normal, I think, are really new to GRE in this particular workshop. So uh, if this is like a lot coming at you really fast, that's totally normal. Um, don't feel bad about it. That Take away a couple things that feel useful to you, and then maybe you're like, oh, I'm going to do some more practice with geometry. Yeah, being really precise about radius and diameter is also important too. All right. So thinking about taking, taking your time to, at the start of problems, taking your time to unpack them, um, draw the shape, write down the formulas you know. And maybe if you're just starting out, that's where you get. You're like, I redraw the shape, I focus on what I'm looking for, I write down the formulas I remember, and I just get that setup step down. So maybe that's where you're at right now. And that's great. If you're starting out, that's a great place to be. Um, maybe it's just if you're feeling really comfortable with this material, not rushing so you don't make small errors. And then if you feel overwhelmed by stuff, taking it apart piece by piece, thinking about each chunk of information, the upfront information in each quantity separately. Okay, let's try one more. This one is pretty tricky. So some of you I think are ready and gunning for a challenge. This is a pretty tricky, challenging problem. Um, some of you I know are new. If you're trying to solve this one, you get stuck, chat me and, and ask for a hint. Ask if I can help. Um, if you're new, also focus just on getting the setup and the sort of opening processing steps down. Um, and don't worry if it is not all happening quickly right now. That's why we study. It takes time to get there. So here we go. Give you a couple minutes to work on this.
All right. I'm going to pause there, not because you necessarily should have been able to finish in that time, but I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about it. And we are coming up to the hour. So let's talk about it. All right. What is the first thing that you did solving this problem? What's the first thing we should do? Yeah, we want to redraw. Yep. So two cool things. I want to redraw and I want to label. I want to label. I know this radius of this small circle is going to be R. And then I also want to focus on what I'm looking for, which is, again, that kind of shaded region, that ring. And I know that to find that, I am also going to need the diameter of the big circle. So I have a sense of what I have and what where I am going. Um, to answer a very good question that I just got, I, we would want on a problem like this to take around two minutes. And on average for QC, we'd want to take around a minute, 15 seconds. So non-QC like this, around two minutes, maybe a little more because this is a tricky one for QC a little bit faster. All right, so I know what I have in pink and I know ultimately where I'm going. What else do I need to use? Like I know that the radius of the small circles are, so I could actually even start by writing the area of small here, it's pi r squared. What else do I need to use to find the diameter or the radius of the big circle? Yeah, I also have a square here. So I need to deal with the square in some way. And I see that the sides of the square, you know, if I think about this also being R, this being the diameter of this circle, this being R here, the sides of the square are going to be 2R and 2R. So if the side of the square is 2R, what is that hypotenuse going to be? I have an isosceles triangle, and then I know that it's a square. So I have right angles. Yeah, this is my 45, 45, 90 triangle. So I know that the diameter large equals 2r square root 2. So the radius of the large equals r square root 2. It's one half of that. So now I can plug that in to find the area of the large. So it's going to be pi r square root 2 squared. So then I have pi r squared. Square root 2 squared just undoes the square root, so that gives me 2. So I have 2 pi r squared minus pi r squared, and I get pi r squared, which is my answer choice C. One thing to learn from this problem is use all info given in geometry. So if you find, oh, this is tricky, I'm getting stuck, Think about which of these shapes haven't I used? Because sometimes we focus a lot on the circles here and we might overlook the square. So saying, like, okay, I've overlooked the square. That's where I want to focus. That's often the key to my solution. And then same as with all geometry, start small, draw, start with the information you have. See, can I take one step from there? And then can I take another step from there? So you know what your goal is, but you're getting there in incremental steps. And that process combined with a good knowledge of geometry rules will make even the hardest geometry problems feel doable. We are almost at time, but before we go, I would love for everyone to take a moment and think and then share, come back, chat to everyone. So to all panelists and attendees, chat to the whole group and share what's one takeaway that you have from what we've done today. What's something that you wanna remember and you think might be useful? Good thing to do at the end of every study session, just recap top like two, three points. Yeah, know your rules. There are a lot of geometry rules, but there's also a lot of geometry on the test. So this is a topic area that's really worth investing time in memorizing. Yep. Only percents, 
pick a number. Approach piece by piece. Don't assume. Yeah, yep. Taking time to have a solid process approach is definitely greater than just rushing in, for sure. <laughs> yeah, practice. Yep. Watch details. Awesome. Yeah, QC is compare, not calculate. Cool. All right. Um, thank you so much for being here. This was awesome. Thank you for being so engaged. We did a ton of stuff today. Uh, it was kind of a whirlwind, um, but I, it looks like everyone is hopefully taking at least one good thing away. Um, if you are interested in other free prep options, you can try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quant, is, quant can be rough, but it's very masterable. I will say this, Forrest, I am not a math, like I'm not a math person, like I never liked math. I didn't take any math in college. I was so happy to avoid it. I took music theory instead of taking math when I was in college. So I'm not someone who like feels like super strong about math, but GRE math is different and it's, it's a much more conquerable skill. Um, so that's my caveat about math. Yeah, I'm so happy it was helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, you can also trial the first session of one of our classes for free. Um, you can find them on our website. So for three hours, and that class will include like a much broader overview of sort of what the GRE is and what the question tapes are and all that core information. Um, we always have them running both online and in person, depending on where you are. Um, I am teaching an online class one next Tuesday. There's lots running all the time. So that's another free thing you can check out. Um, and yeah, uh, be in touch if you have questions and I will uh, wish you the best of luck as you continue studying. Thanks so much. Have a great night.